we were signing up these local merchants, but there was a problem, which was you had to go to a physical spot to redeem something. Mm -hmm. And what makes the product work now was two essential things that we implemented that we didn't have originally, and it really changed the dynamics. We didn't even have to quote unquote pivot that much, but we changed the focus just a little bit and things started working. Whereas before we had some users using it and creators using the platform, but those small merchants couldn't pay. They were pretty small. Right. And so the amounts they could pay were very small, especially back then when no one believed in like Instagram as an advertising source. Right. But also you had to be in a physical spot to redeem the deal. There simply wasn't as many creators back then. So it was failing. Mm -hmm. um, there were tough times with our early team. We raised a little bit of money, but we were running out of runway. This is Start of the Storefront. Today's guest is Corbett Drummy, founder of Popular Pays, a platform that enables brands to easily connect with creators and influencers, and vice versa, all in the name of generating sponsored social media posts. Corbett started out in traditional advertising and noticed the inefficiencies rife within an aging structure. As he puts it, the past 100 years were the century of the agency, but the next 10 are the decade of the creator. This episode was actually taped right before California went on a statewide stay-at-home order, and thus was the last time we recorded an episode in person. Man, this is just one of those things I took for granted without taking the time to fully appreciate how much fun it was to sit down face-to-face -face with a guest. The energy in the room was always so electric. This episode is no exception, as it was a sort of reunion for Diego and Corbett, as they were both part of the Y Combinator class of 2015. So listen in as we cover everything from why Vine failed, how the initial idea for Pop Pays came from an inebriated stream of thought, and all things Y Combinator. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. We're here with Corby from Popular Pays. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Tell everyone what Popular Pays is. So Pop Pays is a platform for connecting brands and content creators. So people usually come to us for one of two things. They want to scale content, you know, on their Instagram page or on their Facebook ads, or they want posts from influencers like a TikTok video or a YouTube or Instagram story. So what we do is we have a community of content creators and also a software suite where brands can uh, search and find the right creator, collaborate with them, and then track all the work that they're doing, whether it's the content they're making or the, the posts that they're getting. And you started the company in 2015? No, it was so although we um, when we first connected in 2015 through Y Combinator, we'd started in 20, mid-2013. Okay, and give us a sense of the landscape. So 2013, yeah. Instagram, new. It was, it was really new. Twitter I, was everything. Yeah, I, I, I remember, so at the time, I was working at an advertising agency called Leo Burnett, if you remember the Allstate commercials, the guy in the suit that always gets into accidents. Mayhem. Mayhem, yeah. Yeah. So good. He's, yeah. Those are still going. They're still going. Yeah. Um, guy, he's like made a, a career celebrity. out of it. Yeah. yeah. So um, I was working on those and everyone gravitated towards the TV commercials because, you know, it's um, these big production shoots, um, really cool post-production, all that stuff. And being the most junior person probably on the team, I was an assistant account executive one of the only outlets that I could really apply myself to is social. And so hmm. we had just gotten a Facebook page. We were trying to push them on Twitter. Instagram was unheard of. I remember in 2012 when I was first there, I first started Instagram. And it was when someone was like, Mobile Molly, this this mobile guru at the agency was talking about like <laughs> things. And, and someone asked her, what are your favorite apps? And my co-founder of the audience, like she, she was asking around the audience. And he goes, oh, Instagram. And she goes, I love Instagram too. And it's one of those things where you hear things twice in a row like i remember the first time i heard serial like three times in the space of like 10 minutes in terms of podcast yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. i gotta check this the out murder mystery yeah so the, i yeah, yeah. downloaded instagram i showed all my friends it was amazing because you could take a photo and it magically made life look better i remember the filters the made filters, things look better yeah, yeah yeah and um so we were experimenting with that but brands hadn't moved to it yet right Not this even is close. super easy yeah or super and, early rather. yeah super early yeah. and um it was so early the first time we ever crossed into the idea I remember um, Alan, my co-founder, was really into Instagram. He's always been an innovator and in, like getting on the newest thing. And he was following these people. He had never met them in real life, but you know these people had a couple thousand followers, which back then was a lot. Yeah. And we were at a party, and he was probably a little, little tipsy, and he was leaning <laughs> against our fridge, and he said, "I want to throw a party that you can't get into unless you have 500 Instagram followers." Wow. And I was Ooh, like, "That's pretty cool." The first pretty cool. branded influencer. Yeah. And, and so I, you're checking phones at the door. <laughs> yeah. Like you check your. So we were like, "Who could we pitch this to?" Because before Allstate, I'd worked at. Um, I was actually. When I interned there, I was on the Miller Coors team. 
I wasn't even 21 when I joined. And so when I sat down the first meeting, they passed out a keystone and I was like, this is amazing. I'm not even 21 <laughs> yet. And they're like, what? And they took me off the account until I turned 21. And then I got back on. But I was contacting like our Miller course friends on the account, other people in the um, broader like publicist agency portfolio, because we were pitching it to like uh, Stoli Vodka or other people. Because yeah, we wanted this like amazing events with all kinds of Instagrammable things where it was just a brand activation that you'd get carded at the door and then you'd get your Instagram would get carded. And we we put together a pitch deck and we had no exposure to budgets being like, you know, really junior teammates. But we just were like, how much would this probably cost? And we're like, I don't know, 40 grand. And so we pitched it to Stoli, I think, and, or Svedka, I think it was Stoli. This is amazing. Kind of got like looped in up the chain. Like, you know, it was interesting. And so people would loop in there. It got, like, went up the chain of command. Eventually, it actually went all the way up to the COO and the CCO of Burnett. And I remember there was an internal conflict. And get this, this is how early it was. <laughs> Leo Burnett said at the time, look, one of our other brands is doing something on Instagram this quarter. We can't have two brands doing something on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, so they said, not now. They don't want to oversaturate <laughs> the market. Yeah. It was just so early. And so like, I can't remember when we first started talking about it, but I but you, you recognize at that time sort of the, the ability to to play into these, to connect these two players, the yeah. brands and, and oh, the influencers. So, yeah, that, that was like, so maybe like late 2012, we kind of shelved the idea, but we were obsessed with it. So we tried other ideas. Alan and I were kind of obsessed with trying to start some side project. Um, and we had a bunch of ideas, but we kept coming back to this and we eventually just started doing it on the side with our own brand. So we yeah. reach out to local merchants. So. We signed up these local merchants. Like what kind of merchants? Like a coffee shop? Or coffee like, shop, okay. restaurants. We got rejected a lot, but we would just sure. like ride around in his element and he'd run in and pitch the brand. <laughs> and I'd sit in the back working in a business plan because at this time we knew we couldn't, uh, they wouldn't let us do it internally. So we tried to do it internally. But the power I started seeing was that as I was working at Allstate, uh, on the Allstate account, and we were trying to do stuff on Facebook, I remember like the cheapest video I ever made was like an online video explaining how some product work worked on their website and it, that was like 40 grand wow. and we could never get the budget for socials for that so but we realized if we reach out to one of these content creators they could do the same video for like you know 400 bucks or a thousand dollars or whatever sure, sure. and so uh, probably a thousand bucks um and so we realized the power of using creators to number one just like get awareness on new social networks like TikTok now or instagram back then influencers are by far and away, like the the best option to get like mass awareness on on something, you just have to do it with the right strategy. Yeah. But then, as the network gets uh, more mature, it's an S curve where influencers become less important in this in the sense of like they have less impact, but their content becomes more important. And so, because there's more of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And also, the ad tools on the networks get more and more um, sophisticated. And so, uh, okay. If you look at Facebook now, their ad advertising systems are so sophisticated that. We all the time, like probably a quarter to, you know, 30% of our campaigns are just purely content creation for things like boosting on Facebook ads because Facebook is such a powerful user acquisition tool. Right. But no one has inst like Facebook influencers really. And so right. Instagram, it's still in this middle ground where influencers are a powerful force, but now just boosting like story ads can drive so much in terms of user acquisition or sales. That's kind of that balance of power has kind of shifted a bit. But on TikTok, it's still in that brand new part of the S curve where an influence, like one of our influencers for our Columbia Records campaign got like 400,000 impressions and, wow. and the cost per thousand impressions was well under a dollar. Right. For, wow. And so like, totally. yeah, and that's like when things hit, they go viral on there. But TikTok is structured in a way where it's more prone to go viral. So influencers are even more impactful there. So it's been a really interesting, really interesting market. But long story short, we were pitching these like small merchants. We were trying to save money. You know, we were making very little at the time. I <laughs> and you guys even, are bootstrapping this yeah, for sure, yeah. right? I can't even believe how um, how little we were making. And looking back, I wasn't <laughs> was even- Was it like $1,200 a month? Like, it was, uh, I was making 38000 a year. Okay. And in, in Chicago, you know, that in 2011 or 2012- Not bad. Right? It, it was You're bad, still bad. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but looking back now, I mean- I don't know how I did it because I even managed to save some money. <laughs> and um, I remember in the mornings I would like wake up and make breakfast for, and lunch. When we first quit our jobs, I would make breakfast and lunch for my co-founders, Alan and Nathan, because I knew that if I didn't make lunch for Alan, he'd go out and buy it and we couldn't afford it. Super expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd make like quesadillas for him. But we were like saving some money. You know, I would go to work. I'd put in a full day of work at Burnett. Like, you know, I used to get up early back then. I'd probably wake for work from like... 
8 to 5.30 or 6. But, you know, I'd, I'd eat the cereal on the Kellogg's floor for breakfast. And, you know, there's free beer on the Miller Coors floor. So uh, every day I'd leave with a beer in my, you know, in, in my hand. Um, and that, but, uh, yeah, we were saving money, working after hours. Once we had, like, three months of money saved up, we were so foolishly, we were like, all right, we're good. Like, let's, And you quit. You quit yeah, your jobs. Yeah. Alan, I was going to Did you have longer. a product or what? We did. Um, but Just it a was, website? It was pairing? super MVP. Yeah, okay. it was like the fir- very, fir- we were pretty clever with it. I think, <clears throat> I can't remember if this was Alan or Nathan's idea. The very first quote unquote product was simply a private Instagram page where we would post the deals that if you had 500 followers, you could go get that free product at okay. that restaurant. <laughs> so for example, if you had 500 followers or more, we'd let you in to see the page and then you could see all the deals and you would just kind of like hold that up and they would just check your Instagram account and they'd give you the product. So it was like, there was no tech involved. We were just like, how do we get this up today? Right. And that's, that was how we did it. I remember the day we signed up that that's first amazing. merchant. Yeah. I knew the day that <laughs> I should have known because my gut also told me that day that it wasn't going to work because we signed up this merchant. It was like March of 2013, March 21st, I think. And um, we signed up this local merchant, this amazing coffee shop, shout out to Heritage Coffee in Chicago. And their founder met with us. He's like, I'm in. It was a connection of Nathan's. And we put up this sign. It said, like, have 500 followers, get a free cup of coffee. And we sat there all day and, like, no one no one redeemed it. And we're like, mm, there's probably a problem in our model. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's many, there were many problems. But it took a year of painful learning. But so, so what year is it now? Is it, like, 2013, 2014? Yeah, 2013, going okay. into 2014, we were signing up these local merchants. But there was a problem, which was you had to go to a physical spot to redeem something. Mm-hmm. And what makes the product work now was two essential things that we implemented that we didn't have originally, and it really changed the dynamics. We didn't even have to quote unquote pivot that much, but we changed the the focus just a little bit and things started working. Whereas before we had some, some users using it and creators using the platform, but those small merchants couldn't pay. They were pretty small. right? And so the amounts they could pay were very small, especially back then when no one believed in like Instagram as an advertising source. Right. But also you had to be in a physical spot to redeem the deal. And then um, there simply wasn't as many creators back then. So it was failing. Mm. Um, there were tough times with our early team. We raised a little bit of money, but we were running out of runway. Like friends and family type round? No, we, we scraped by and I think like one person put in like 10K that was from the friends and family side, but okay. we found a bunch of angel investors that each put in like 10 or 20. Nice. We ended up raising like 200 at first. When That's we put great. in the first 100, we were like, oh, man, we never have to work again. This is so much money. <laughs> <laughs> but it was falling apart because we weren't growing. Our run was shrinking and it was hard to raise money. But Alan left and he joined Instagram. My, my co-founder left and joined Instagram. And Nathan and I parted ways because um, he, he was the creator. He had a thriving business in himself as a designer, as a content creator. He had a lot of work, whereas I, as a account executive, was extremely unemployable. Right. And there's right. you can't be a part-time assistant Salesperson. account executive. Yeah. Right. Or, yeah. And double AEs in uh, the ad industry aren't even sellers. You know, they're, they're they have no exposure to budgets. So they're just basically like a junior project manager. So got it. We had this one engineer, Stephen, and um, he and I worked to kind of rebuild the next version. But we added just a few things, and that made it click. We added briefs. So the brand could say, this is the kind of content I want. We opened it up so that brands could pay. So um, it was not just local coffee shops, but you know, Paige Denim or Gap or Nike or anyone could um, put a brief out and say, I'll pay you for this content, but we need this type of content. Right. And so that naturally attracted bigger creators. And we had a huge creator base at that point. So How did you grow that creator base at the beginning? That was always, um, so it grew kind of viral at first because we had all these local deals and it was kind of neat. And so okay. it was growing just by word of mouth on the creator side. Yeah. But as soon as we got the first paying brand, I think it was... Um, How did you grow that side? Were so you reaching we, we out to brands? A, we asked a creator. We said, like, who's reaching out to you? And um, Oh, interesting. Yeah, a friend... Okay. A friend, Grant Legan, that said, um, smart. Paige Denham uh, reached out to him and we contacted them. They just put in something small. It was like three to five grand. But as soon as we got that, I knew that we had a business because our whole burn rate was probably like three to five grand. And so right. we got this like campaign. We easily set it out to our creators. They applied. We did this campaign. And um, from that moment, I knew we had a business and it was just finding more brands. And every time we found a brand, there were so many creators who wanted to do that work. And when we first actually launched, that was kind of manual at first, but when we launched quote unquote paid gigs, so the product we have today, we launched it on October 21st, 2014. And we got, I think 20 grand in that first month, whereas we had never made, I think we made 20 grand in like 
the last year and a half of the company. Got it. And so we, that's when we knew it was working. And was there a shift in the market? Like, did brands just start realizing the power of Instagram? And so at the beginning, you were kind yeah. of ahead with that, or were yeah. you no, literally it, it, like it, the pitching market them? changed? Like, I used okay. to go into coffee shops and pitch them. It was so it was tough. Every time I'd go to get a coffee, <laughs> I couldn't just enjoy it because I'd have to. I'd have to pitch them. Right. And it was like the grind of like I'd get lunch or I'd get coffee and I'd be like, all right. Here we go. <laughs> and I'd pitch them and they'd be like, yeah. And I was only just telling them, give a free cup of coffee. I wasn't even like asking for money at that point. And I couldn't even convince people to give a cup of coffee in exchange for a post. And I was telling them, you get content, you get the post and awareness, you know, like maybe 500 impressions. You get, uh, oftentimes when they redeem that free product, they get, they buy more stuff anyways. They might bring a friend, they'll come back. Totally, yeah. But over time, the industry definitely shifted. And it's still shifted to the point where at first we were able to get people interested in trying a campaign. Mm -hmm. And then now, like cuts it today, it's at a point where almost every big brand is doing this regularly. So they just need software to do it. So it's gone beyond just like, oh, do a campaign for me. It's like, oh, we do these campaigns or we have this creator base. Let's find the best software to scale the work that we're doing. So it's it's right. continued to evolve even today. Do the individual store managers at these coffee chains that you were visiting have the authority to buy into your pitch? Like, yeah, you know, that's a good question. Up? So like half the time I'd strike out and they'd be like, mm. dude, I just work here. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, but then um, <laughs> a lot of times I met some cool people. Like I, I met some founders of uh, different coffee shops or restaurants and I met a lot of cool people. And unless you're at a chain like a blue bottle or an intelligentsia, like a, a medium or a large chain, those small ones, you know, oftentimes you'll bump into the founders that they're working there right now. Mm. So mm -hmm. we, we met some cool folks in Chicago, made some friends, um, and they often did have the authority to just try it out, especially because we weren't asking for much. But it's right. funny how much, like, I really, ad I'd really advise anyone starting a company to charge for your product as soon as you can, because they always say like. If you want advice, ask for money. Right. If you want money, ask for ask advice. For advice yeah. Um, yeah. So like basically we went into this and, and once we started asking for money, we were getting this advice of like what they would really pay for. And that's when we realized, oh, well, they need to dictate what the content would be. Also, we started stumbling into like, hey, these bigger brands really do have a lot more to play with. And it's not that much more complicated of a sale. We lucked out in that one of our early deals was uh, Nike. And so when we were applying to Y Combinator, we had, we were on What this, made you want to apply to Y Combinator? Oh, I just always, uh, Paul Graham's essays. Yeah. It's like Hemingway writing. Tell people uh, who Paul Graham is. So don't Paul know. Graham, he's my, uh, my, one of my startup heroes, probably the startup hero, although I have many. But I remember just when I was in college at William & Mary, I think the only other startup that came out of William & Mary before ours was... Uh, like Thomas Jefferson's age, like there was nothing coming out of there. Like it, it's an old school. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But now there's like right after. So my friends and I started one in, in college, and then um, shout out to Ad Hoc. Um, a friend Todd launched one like you know right after graduating yeah, as well. Yeah, they're doing well. They seem to be. They're doing, doing great. Well. They're yeah. crushing it. And um, so and it seems to be more thriving. They've got a thriving entrepreneurship center. Right when I was getting into there, they built a new school of business, like Mason School of Business, and it was really starting to pick up already. But it was kind of like the right place, right time. But I was just like, I don't know, naturally curious about startups and technology. I had been reading online and I came across Paul's essays. But Paul Graham, he's a startup founder who sold via web to Yahoo for like $200 million. And he's an extremely smart guy. He's very a very independent thinker. But when he writes, he writes so simply that it sounds like, it looks like Hemingway's writing, but it's about startups. And so it's a really powerful combo. And he doesn't waste space. Like if he just right. needs three paragraphs to communicate his thought, the, the article is three paragraphs. If he needs more, it's more. And so I was reading these and we launched like a tutor matching startup in William & Mary. It was like a marketplace. And I remember I was like, I was like, yeah, we could do this. And we were making some money, like not enough to, as, to have it be our day jobs or like we didn't even think of raising money. But then I saw a company from YC get funded that was doing exactly what we were doing. And I was like, oh, it's oh, over. Wow. Yeah. It's over. Because they were just such a juggernaut. YC had funded like Dropbox, Airbnb, Reddit, and it's like everything they touched was just gold. But I remember we applied to YC for popular pays about a year in or whatever, or like less than a year in, and we didn't get, we didn't, we didn't really hear back. And then we applied in that little growth spurt when we first launched paid gigs, and we got an interview, and it was just a mad like even the interview was magical. Like, how was your experience like going through? Because like, what was your experience going through YC and and how it was for you guys? So people listening, Y Combinator is like an accelerator program in Mountain View, California. A lot of big companies, Airbnb, you mentioned them, Dropbox, and there's a there's a ton of other ones. Stripe. Stripe, yeah. yeah. For for me, 
it was really cool, man. It was like you're meeting these legends, right? These, yeah. Like Justin Kahn, who started Twitch. Um, and Paul B. I can't pronounce Paul the last name. Buchet, Buchet, like the founder, the founder of, of Gmail. How do you pronounce it? Buchet? Buchet, Buchet yeah. Yeah, Buchet. And, um, so, and so you're meeting all these like legends and you realize there's two things, right? They're just people. Mm -hmm. It's almost yeah. like meeting a celebrity. Yeah. So, so you're like, oh, this person is uh, just a human. Yeah. And you realize their gifts aren't, and this is not to be disrespectful. It wasn't intellect. It was persistence. Yep. It was like they just had a vision or were super passionate and were very persistent yep. to the point of not quitting. And then you get to ask them for advice. Yeah. And uh, Michael Siebel, who's now the, the CEO, mm -hmm. he also like co-founder of Twitch, I just loved him because he'll spend 10 seconds with you and tell you like your idea is shit. Or, like, <laughs> he'll just like candidly say like, you're fucked. Like he'll draw you a curve. Like this is where you think you are. And, this, and then it was like a cliff and he's like, this is where you're actually. So the best advice is always the ones where it's like a gut punch. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so the way I think about Y Combinator is like these guys are guardrails or I used to use the reference, they're bumpers when you're bowling, mm. Mm. right? And they're just there to make sure you don't fall into the gutter. It's, good. it's good metaphor. Yeah. And, and But it's wonderful. And yeah. it's also so empowering because you realize they're just like you, yeah. right? They're, they're super like you. I remember you. Um, talking to Justin Kahn. It was Alexis from Reddit that called us to say that we were in. And that's a whole other story. Like the interview getting in it was just like a alexis magical... serena williams is yeah, partner yeah. for those wondering yeah so that's alexis, a name drop oh <laughs> yeah and so when he called me i was like fanboying fangirling you know because yeah I, i'm such a huge like reddit user alone like let alone that but it's it's him and i try to negotiate with him on like the percentage and he's like he's like clear <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> and i'll get to that they actually helped us tremendously later in that area of like because we had raised a little bit of money at that point we actually got to like 750k before yc because we had that growth spurt um in terms of money raised so we were trying to negotiate that but he he had quickly had to leave and go back into reddit temporarily and then gary from delicious cat the chief of staff for um alexis at reddit and then justin khan were our main partners mm. but i always remember like interacting with justin for example it was like interacting with like an older smarter more accomplished brother where like yeah he's really driven very clever but it didn't seem like <laughs> with talking with them they just kind of remind you of the basics like talk to your users and they'd make you better by reminding you of what to think about and um checking your assumptions it was also encouraging because they showed you how to do it it wasn't just like right they're just um if you're ever in trouble they'll probably just like tell you an answer to save you time but they're always kind of walking you through it yeah so it made it approachable I do remember though sometimes I think I went to Sam Altman one time and okay. um, he just we could never get on Sam's counter. It was dude, always like Sam just, super, just, just like email a, me. <laughs> he's, yeah, he, just like a, a parent would like uh, you know we'll walk you through. But I think we were short on time for something. He's like, okay, here's your answer, and he just that was the answer. He like gave us the answer, and so sometimes uh, he he definitely really impressed me with with that. I remember we were unfortunately it was Paul's. Um, Paul Graham's last years mm -hmm. um, so he had just left and Sam took over yeah Sam's extremely ambitious but some of the stuff I've learned from Sam is just like the ambition and stuff alone because yeah he's a human like all of us but he has these philosophies like make every new project you do ambitious enough to where it makes your last one look like a footnote and like yeah. that's inspiring that's really inspiring yeah. I was just gonna say when we we had a meeting with Paul so Paul had retired kind of yep. some way right and um he like opens his office hours. Office hours is just a time for you to schedule a time to sit down with Paul. And Paul hadn't been around for most of the batch. The, the yeah. batch, yeah. And so he does it. And what happens naturally is like it just fills up. His schedule fills up. So mm -hmm. we get like a four o'clock slot, and we're there. We get there like at three. We're waiting. He's talking to all the startups, and he's talking to you before he's oh, talking to us. And I, I can't wait to tell you about how that went. But and I was ahead. like. <laughs> Who the hell is he talking to? Because it's like 4.30 <laughs> and he's still talking to, to Corby. Um, and I'm like, what is happening? What are they hilarious. talking about? I'm like, this camp, why is it an hour? We're an hour in. So do you know, I was like so excited for this conversation and I go to meet Paul Graham because he's almost like, it's almost like some startup god just ascended and he's so yeah. aloof because he just doesn't care anymore. He's, he's wearing sand, Birkenstocks, yeah, You hear the stories chilling. about how like someone will try to mess with one of the YC startups and he just like walks into the, the company's like, lobby with his like Birkenstocks and he's like hey you're gonna stop what you were doing and they're like okay Paul and he's like Cause, yeah otherwise we're not gonna have you go to any YC demo days anymore and they're like okay we'll, we'll stop and he just walks <laughs> yeah, away totally but he was um he came in for the office interviews and I was so excited I was like hey Paul do you mind if I record this conversation just so I can pay attention I can reference it later and he's like do you realize your shoes entirely match the carpet? And I was so not ready for that to be the first thing he said. And I looked down and it's kind of crazy. My shoes blended in completely with the carpet. And I was like, wow, you're, you're right. 
and that's how the convo kicked off. <laughs> but he gave you know tremendous advice, but he almost was like, if you talk to Sam, he was almost like laser focused, helping you in the problem. But Paul almost like ascended to this point where he would ask me these questions, but he's like, but I mean, you know, what's, what are you really trying to solve here for? Like, what's right. the, what, what are you really going for? Like the point of life is to be happy, right? Like, and he'd almost bring it too far above like the realm of what we were focusing on, but he gave some really amazing thoughts on how to position things. Yeah. Maybe when you thought he was, uh, going I thought he was going to cancel our meeting. That yeah. was my concern. I yeah. was like, oh, he's running over. I really loved, I, I mean, I loved every minute at YC. I remember later, like a few weeks later, I was in the cafeteria for some reason and uh, Paul and Sam were there and wow. um, Paul's like, you're um, uh, you're Caruso drummer, right? And I'm like, that's close enough, Paul. <laughs> Corbett drummy, you know, you can call me many things, but it's close. Caruso <laughs> drummer. Yeah, and so um, my teammate Pete, he, uh, he admit, people call me many things like, you know, Corby, whatever, uh, but he's the only one that calls me Caruso still. What was uh, raising money like? So you had demo day, was it, was it successful for you? It was, I was so nervous. I remember, um, uh, I forget exactly the company's name, but right before me, this guy, Phil, I forget his last name, like Axar or Azar or something like that, but he was on that shipping company. Uh, uh, you know, it starts with P. Yeah. Packable, maybe, I don't know. But I forget. Um, yeah. he was doing these like exercises. He was like putting his hands up and like whew, doing some breathing exercises. <laughs> and I was like, maybe I should be doing more to prep. <laughs> and, um, you That's know, funny. he crushed his, his presentation. And, um, but we were lucky. We went up there and, we still have it. Like it's a link on YouTube. We could probably even attach it to the notes, but yeah. it went well. We met a lot of amazing investors after the demo day. Although we'd struggled, we raised in three months. We only raised like a hundred or two hundred when we first started Pop Pays. In a month and a half, I think we'd raised like two million and capped out at like what we were trying to do. That's great. Um, it was f the only time I've ever experienced what it's like to be, you know, the hot startup or where, where like w fundraising is usually pushing a boulder up a hill, whereas we had just. We we're at capacity for the first time. We had to like return money away, and it was pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. What was the thing that these investors saw? Were they like, we don't really know? Inst I'm, I'm just yeah. I'm thinking out yeah. loud. Were they like, we think we know Instagram. We're not really sure. We think this makes sense. I think it's like I think it's kind of people actually right now are treating TikTok the same way, where mm. it's something that's. Um, but there's more precedence now. There right? is. There is. And you, that you can you can um, assimilate that information in your head because you've seen like the rise of Instagram and right. Facebook, but right. with the rise of Facebook, you didn't see the rise of influencers. Correct. Whereas you saw the rise of the creator community. I actually saw it most with Vine, which is interesting. People, oh, yeah. people forget Vine. It changed culture. Like Vine was so important and I never thought Pop Pays would live longer than Vine, <laughs> like, <laughs> but Vine was such an important thing. Why do, you, why do you think Vine failed? They turned their back on the creator community. Okay. Yeah, I thought about it a lot and uh, well, it's That's... also Twitter bottom and you right. know, um, it's really hard to <laughs> revenue goals are important. Yeah. It's like really hard to integrate a company and it's no diss at Twitter. I have a lot of friends there. It's a great company. I, I actually used to just poke fun at Jack Dorsey saying like, he's no Elon Musk. What's he trying to do running both companies? But dude, Square and Twitter, they're both, you know, very well run machines. Um, Square itself is crazy. I just think th what the problem is in some cases is culture takes these platforms and does really interesting things with them. And so Twitter has sort of become part of the political campaign yeah. and, and then it makes it makes a company have to pick a side much like a television show right yeah or like yeah. a fox or a cnn it's like all of a sudden who's the owner what are the thoughts yeah. and is there bias well, how do we allow it with vine specifically though the creator community was basically saying like we don't like certain ones of these changes we're driving all the use like with any network whether it's reddit or whatever it follows the Pareto law that you know 20 percent of the users drive um, you know, the activity in the 80% are passive, but it's even more like of that 20%, 2% of them are like the most active and really drive almost everything. Right. And there was a small amount of creators. Like that's where you saw the birth of everyone, you know, love them or hate them. I, I don't really love them, but like Logan Paul, et cetera, like, you know, that kind of class of creators that came up. Sure. Um, but there was, they were super important in the sense that they were a new media channel. They were driving immense creativity, like the amount of creativity if you just scroll through TikTok, you can kind of recapture that magic of Vine where it's just um, some of the most addictive, funny clips you will see. And you can spend 40 minutes watching seven second clips or like you know, 30 second clips. Yeah. Vine kind of folded. There was a gap in that short form video segment. And some people like Quibi or whatever are trying to come in and take that. Quibi, yeah. Quibi, yeah. I can't even pronounce it. They Do you really know a little yet. bit about that? Not really. They're just raising a ton of money. But, you know. So, so basically what they're yeah, doing. I don't know anything about them. Yeah. I actually, I was just at an interesting meeting and I got the whole pitch. But basically they're using two cameras. 
So every everything that they film, so you know how a lot of TV oh, shows has so B-roll? Kind of, yeah. You know how a lot of shows have like B-roll of like, here are the trees, blah, 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 mm. right? Yeah, tell us about B-roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <I> know. <laughs> we have Nick in the room, the professional. <laughs> and so what Quibi's doing is getting rid of all the B-roll, getting rid of all of the, I hate to say this, but artistic elements to mm. any television show. Mm. And they're just making it like, Corby says something yeah. to me, I get punched in the face, and it's all action, it's all, and then it's like story. It's like cut to cut. It's like the cut to cut to cut. editing, yeah. And the whole thing is like 10 minutes, I think it's 10 minute television shows or less. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, they're filming it with two cameras. One is horizontal, one is vertical. And they're also filming it from different perspectives. And so if you want to huh. see Nick's perspective, you just flip your phone maybe to horizontal. Oh, and, now cool. you're, and now you're seeing it through Nick's eyes and vice versa. And so there's a story component to this. And they, the whole bet at a really high level is everything is moving toward mobile that's and true. towards streaming. That's and true. that's the bet. And so they're raising money, but they also have a tremendous amount of huge networks on board already huge television content creators but it's also it's just 10 minute clips uh 10 minute videos 10 minute basically mm, that's episodes. fascinating but the, the 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 i think the coolest thing because it hasn't been seen yet is this perspective yeah it's like you yeah yeah which is fa and, and i haven't seen how they're gonna actually what it looks like or what it feels like but directionally correct in terms of where i think the market is moving. Not to say that everything needs B-roll, but the fact that they are getting away from <laughs> it entirely. <laughs> it's all about that B-roll. <laughs> the fact that they're getting away from it entirely from a story perspective, yeah. I think is just interesting. At this point, I am going to have to go and research this some more, but I, you are really taking away the creator's ability to allow the audience to sink in. Because that's what B-roll really does. It's just a, I just think a chance to don't envelop care. the story. It's, you, or the bet is, right? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But the, the yeah. bet is yeah. it doesn't... And so when I think about movies, right? Movies, mm -hmm. you don't need really hooks in the middle. You just need kind of your typical build the character, a little bit of a climax, drama, end, right? And movies sort of follow this, this trajectory. Television shows have to have a hook at the yeah. end, right? They have to, or else you're not going to watch the next episode. Right. And I just think Quibi says, screw both of that. Hmm. We're just going to tell you the story with all of it and no waste of time, no waste of mm. character building. Are, are there kind sequential of a thing. shows? Like, are there hooks at each ten minute thing? I would think so. I would think so. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah, but I mean, super interesting. We'll see, right? But it I, seems like it a makes big sense. Because, um, like, I think the bet is sound. And look, if you have enough capital, you, you can make stuff work. <laughs> yeah. But um, for example, TikTok is dominating the short form, like you know, sixty, like fifteen to sixty second stuff. And um, you know, there's always going to be like the the parasite feature film where it's just the b-roll itself is so beautiful where i just was astounded in the opening scenes like the gorgeous shots and there's like the craftsmanship of the feature film but quibi is is that pronounced quibi quibi, quibi. Yeah. they're they're it looks or like at they're, least that's how it was told I don't to know. me they're, they're, I, it looks like they're betting on number one that there's a format in between um and then number two they're betting a lot on that and that people will gravitate towards that new um usually you only see user behavior like that start from like in a groundswell move like start small and grow it's hard to do a top-down user behavior change of like oh this is how we're watching shows now right so it is a big bet and i think about it too like igtv hasn't really hit in my mm, opinion yet no. and so that's right. the only form that today you know you can go vertical horizontal oh, on its own you, you couldn't before so we had right, to, we ended right. up making all these igt videos that we had to Nick had I it. had to make this <laughs> infographic that's like so... turn your phone now mm. and and because I would just upload it sideways mm -hmm. and then force people to just turn their phone because you do lose a lot in the nine by sixteen yeah scale yeah. Um, but just real quick I want to touch more on this B roll thing <laughs> uh, just <laughs> one, one one point <laughs> he's so upset. one point I want to make is that I wonder if this is going to be like the taste test between Coke and Pepsi. So mm. like with no B-roll, maybe you will like it at first, mm. but over time, you're not going to want to watch this because it doesn't sit as well with you. Because that's what B-roll allows you to do. It allows you to become a part of this environment or the show or whatever. Are you familiar with the Coke versus oh, yeah. Pepsi no, taste test? I thought testing? it was actually a good analogy. Yeah. 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 So it's like, you know, at first uh, sip, Pepsi has a much uh, sweeter taste to it, so people will gravitate towards that. But I'm wondering over time if Quibi will. Quibi? Qui Quibi. Quibi. I can't see it. Dude, it's also yeah. maybe the name's it's an making issue. you Quibi. Yeah, it is, it is making me Quibi. But yeah, so I'd be interested to one, learn more about Quibi, but then two, see what the, the I, development of it is over time. I look at it differently. I look, so we don't have a TV, right? I haven't had a TV in like six years. When Good I watch for you. it, I really respect that. When I watch a commercial, though, I am oh, dude. amazingly entertained. I'm like <laughs> that, like I'll start laughing commercial, <laughs> laughing like, wow, that was so well done. And I think 
Quibi, when it launches what it does, I think it puts more, it almost highlights the B-roll in movies and sort of cinematic mm. whatever, right? I, that's how I think about it. It's just like I watch a commercial today and I'm blown away. I think people will watch movies and be blown away by the content, the curation, and they'll appreciate B-roll more. That principle of like, um, when I went into advertising, I remember thinking like, look, I love this space because it's the intersection of art plus business. So there's like creativity plus it's solving a business problem. And to me, the North Star of advertising should be that number one, like it's 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 worth watching. Like it's, it's either giving you some utility, making you aware of something you need to know because it's targeted well, et cetera. But so few times does it live up to that. Like really mm. the only time people say that what you just said is, the Super Bowl, where you right. know, like people invest so much, um, but then the problem with advertising is that they there's such a high fixed cost for that asset that they, they just they just then hammer you with frequency, where you'll see the same thing over and over again to the point where yes, you are aware of that brand now, but it makes you like angry because you've seen the commercial so many times. Yeah, and so the that's an- totally true. Yeah, and so like after, we were thinking about this so much, but like the antidote to it is the variety of like if you're lowering the cost of content production. We do live in an era today where you could really live in a, like a one frequency era where you can just basically, um, as a brand, shrink the cost of content production by working with content creators to the point where you're always giving something new to people unless they're choosing to rewatch it. So I've rewatched some TikTok videos like probably 50 times. Same here. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we can share some later. But like in advertising, you really want to be thinking like, you really want to be breaking out of this model of, you know, spend 20% of your budget on uh, the commercial and then hammer it home with, you know, 80% of your budget at the media buy and just hit people like seven times at least so they mm. remember the brand. You, you need to move beyond that. And yeah. we're, so we're trying to it's, push brands. It's a smart thing you're saying. The, I mean, you're, 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 yeah. <laughs> what you're saying is actually really profound in a lot of ways, right? Thanks. It's like I, moving away from the node, the, the, the touch points. Yeah, and, and, and we've been trying to champion. Deeper. Like the, the, whole, the whole ethos of Pape is when, when Alan, Nathan, and I were sitting at Indie Burger in Chicago, in Chicago it's um, a friend of mine, Cyrus, launched this company, that, uh, this, this restaurant. They had amazing onion rings. Unfortunately, they're no longer around, but we, we launched, we, like we were sitting down and we were talking about this kind of stuff and Alan said, what's one thing we can ask ourselves to where we know we're always heading towards that, this vision? And he came up with uh, the question, is it worth sharing? Because whether it's like the output of the con- of the platform, so it's this piece of content that's worth sharing, that itself is the North Star, but more than that, the experience of using the platform, the teammates we hire, you know, they're so good, they're worth sharing. And so we try to come back as our cultural North Star. But I'm, I've been trying to evangelize this concept of brands that you need to move away from waterfall content creation with high fixed cost investment in your assets to move to more agile content production method where you're testing and learning and, and you know using variety to captivate your um, your audience. And so it's a hard switch, but we've seen totally. like we've seen some people like shout out to Colgate. They we, we went to their North American marketing summit and they're just really leaning into agile content development. Do you content help development. Them? Do you give them some concepts? We do, we do. Some ideas? Okay. Um, we do. And, um, but they, I was actually so surprised that when we came to them, um, they, you know, invited us to their like marketing summit and they almost, they had the whole system itself. Like they, they knew they had some stellar examples of agile content development already and they're leaning into it so well, just being like a startup. But there's this one example where like, I think um, Notre Dame was playing some of their football team and like the local team pulled all the Irish spring out of the aisles and they're like, screw you. <laughs> so Colgate jumped in and they made like some content about it and they donated a bunch of like Irish spring to like the, t- the team that pulled it out and like they just made a- made fun with it. And, and um, it's like that kind of con- it's like that kind of conversation you need to be a part of in this day and age and that's why brands like wendy's we actually aren't even working with them but the people that know how to like be a part of the conversation and 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 play along with the internet basically it's so key and and with networks like uh tiktok there's there's trends every day so it's easy to play along you just have to listen it's like going to a party just listen and then participate you know like talk to your talk to your friends around you so you're in a space where you're connecting brands with influencers where do you see your product moving given given that's like a that north great star question. right so it's pretty I, when you think about culture all of those things i personally think it's very interesting i i, I want to like i don't want to give away all the cards um give them away it, <laughs> so i want to keep a few close to my chest but i'll tell you this it's like, 2020 new decade <laughs> what's your hemingway approach what is uh, it? i'll tell you this so we right today we are software for collaborating with content creators and influencers. Mm-hmm. I believe that 
it was the century of the agency. You know, modern advertising was born like pre World War One in like the 1910s and have been dominant, like agency, the agency model has dominated the next hundred years. But that model needs to evolve. And the agencies that we've seen do really well these days are, are tech enabled. So they're using tools to make themselves more agile. They're yep. moving upstream. And so they're moving into more strategy and, and like leveraging, you know, these creators as content workhorses, but not necessarily doing everything internally themselves. So they're moving upstream, the agency model is evolving. So I really do believe it was like the century of the agency, but it's the decade of the creator. And mm -hmm. moving forward, software will continue to eat everything. It is a boon in the sense that the routine work that no one loves doing, like I used to traffic TV spots with Excel sheets and like submit stuff. And it was just the bane of my existence. And I made mistakes all the time. Sure, so like people sure. aren't even good at that kind of work. Right. But that routine work um, ranging from like, you know, the difficulties around content creation, that routine work is getting automated and improved with workflow software. And so people can lever up into more creative stuff. And so we're going to see our software better inform on the beginning part, like the briefing, like better inform people on how they can make content that's effective. And at the end, use data that you're getting back from the content's performance itself to, to improve content the next time around. And there's some concrete examples that we haven't been toying around with that's really interesting just to basically take data and say, Here's how the content's doing. You give that to the content creator and they're better off. People have been doing this for a long time. And as example, Sesame Street used to play their uh, episodes to kids and just watch where the kids stop paying attention and they just like cut out that section. Right, yeah, so they're like, super good at it. Yeah, it's like using audience data to improve content has been manual for a long time. And we're not reinventing the wheel in a lot of things, but there's certain best practices for every network ranging from factors on like how often people have sound on or not to like how the audience takes in this this content but we're just using that going to give that data to creators and editors to make their workflow better and then we're going to make the system smarter overall just by using less data for marketers and brands so yeah. it's, it's a really exciting uh like decade i think coming up pretty scary month <laughs> very exciting decade coming up <laughs> i think um in a lot of ways it's like the the you, you can democratize the yeah. content creation of it right exactly and if you can make data more accessible I think it also leads to people being more creative. I agree. Right? I and agree. That, I think there's some there's value to that. There's a book. I forget I forget the book, but it's basically making the point that everyone at some point is going to be a celebrity. So the Andy Warhol thing, everyone's got their 15 minutes. Uh, but in their own way, like they'll own the niche. And so oh, if like oh. it's basically like, oh, Corby is really good at creating this content mm -hmm. around founder creation for let's say like your, your vertical. So mm -hmm. it's like people know like Corby's the guy. And then this person makes really cool oil canvases yeah. depicting like it's old becoming vehicles. More of a niche, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you like own niche. your domain. You own. You plant your flag. That's that's an, um, yeah. It's it's definitely been democratizing. Like the the tail is getting longer, right? In the sense right, that right. Um, you know you do have people that are occupying these niches, um, content creators, and it's crazy the amount of people that are like famous on TikTok alone for whatever their you know your their go to things are. It's pretty, pretty astounding how many creators there are. I wonder if you ask kids, it's probably like if you ask them like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'd say their number one answer right now is a TikTok star. Yeah, no, I think that's accurate. It's funny. Uh, so my, my sister-in-law was in London doing like a study abroad and she had a, like a flatmate. His name is Noah. Shout out to them, Nina and Noah. And uh, <laughs> Noah would, would just scare Nina every day. That was like, his thing. He would like bust in the room and scare, but he, he would record it. Yep. So at the end of these three months, he had like a compilation <laughs> yep. of scaring the hell out of yep. Nina. I think I watched that video 45 times. I've seen those, they're very entertaining. I've seen a kid do it to his, uh, like kind of, it's one of those, but he pisses off his parents. I feel bad for the parents, but <laughs> I get I get a lot of gratification out of the videos. Yeah. He was kind of like playing around with different things. And it's funny, he found his niche in just like making his parents yell. And his parents are these unwitting participants because like their yells are just so perfectly like cut for video like oh yeah and uh yeah they're they're unwittingly like encouraging behavior because he's getting millions of views online um and that's creativity today it is it which is. is which is really interesting yeah and you know they're gonna be they're hating him now but when he starts bringing in like a hundred grand for a sponsored video they're gonna be like they're gonna have a harder time yelling at him I yeah think. for sure it's like those parents who will say like i used to play video games a lot in high school and um I actually met one of our one of the guys who worked briefly at Hot Pace. We met playing Call of Duty a long time ago. Oh, yeah, wow. Probably getting dinner Online? with him tonight. Yeah, but uh, he, <laughs> That's we, funny. I was playing video games, and um, you know, my parents rightfully so were like, you know, get outside the house, go do other things. But I've seen stories now where 
parents have been saying that, but then these kids now are like pro athletes basically. And right. um, when you think about it, if you play basketball, like your body can only probably handle like four hours a day. The athletic peak, quote unquote, for e-sports is going to be much higher because you can game for like 12 hours a day. <laughs> you have to basically. Yeah, you and so have to. That's there, right. It's going to be more like, you know, Lionel Messi is the best like soccer player ever, but he there's no way he could play practice 12 hours a day, you know? So I think you'll see even more stratification and like peaks in the like prowess of esports than you will for like physical sports but i wonder if like down the road like you know decades down the road if they'll start to cross where you'll, you'll need to be pretty physically fit just even to compete because it might be stuff like vr etc so it'll be like f1 racing these yeah. days it'll be like yeah. super athletes yes yeah. right You're, it's all about reaction Hand time, eye, yeah. reaction time. Mm-hmm. those little micro seconds will yeah. make the difference in like yeah. getting shot in the video game or but not. you also might have people that are just like really fit because maybe they're playing like a vr like shooting game but right you gotta be you kind gotta of, move around yeah you gotta be yeah. fit just to do that so that's an interesting take we'll see we'll see it, it reminds that it reminds me of that video uh like everyone has like the it's like the vr world we're, we're kind of we're kind of getting into that it's it's really possible that at popular pace no 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 no. no. Oh. but i meant just like it's really possible in like you know 2040 a significant portion of our lives is spent just interacting with digital and sure. vr content like I was wondering how VR was going to first make its way into content. I've been looking at it for a long time and it just surreptitiously, it did not come how I thought it first appeared in Snapchat. It was like the AR VR lenses and filters. Mm. And um, it's now become so commonplace that we don't really think about it. But face filters were like the first application of AR and um, it'll become probably more and more. I just remember the Pokemon game. Yeah, that was, that? that was huge. So Pokemon, viral for Pokemon some, Go. Yeah. yeah, and it's like there's different Pokemon in the water. Yeah. And it's like, that's so That was the first like right? real world AR. Like, and people were hooked, man. Yeah, it, w- it blew up so quickly. In ter- terms of like you hear things that are, that are viral, you hear it a few times in one day. I remember, yeah, like hearing the Serial podcast a few times in one day and I went to download it. Pokemon Go was probably the, the biggest, except for like, COVID-19, like Pokemon Go is probably like <laughs> the biggest, uh, like I remember just hearing it so quick, like saw it on Reddit all the time, saw it around the internet, but it, it really flamed out as yeah, some viral infection, <laughs> infections do. Uh, it flamed out and, you know, there's still a lot of people that are playing it, but it didn't take hold in the same way. In, ter- in terms of going, just switching gears back to pop pays, how how do you connect with brands now? Is it different than you used to do it or, or is it now people understand you exist and so they just, influencers and brands just come Good to question. you? question. Um, I know you have an onboarding process. People can yeah, auto. No, yeah, so. definitely. Um, definitely, you know, influencers, we probably get like 500 to 1,000 creators and influencers sign up every month, just word of mouth. And so okay. we do some recruiting there, but interestingly enough, some of the brands themselves will bring in their own influencers to the platform and upload them to the platform or, or do their own searching. Interesting. Um, but on the brand side, we have a sales team. You know, we do marketing. Probably the most effective is just like direct outreach to, to large brands. But we've got a, a network now where, you know, between Pop Pays, YC, our, our, our investors, everything, we can usually get in touch with a brand um, just from that and just like regular sales outreach. Yeah. Marketing, we've been investing in more. Um, but something that's happened recently is we've kind of scaled since we've got a platform that really can be totally self-serve. About a year ago, we started offering just a SaaS solution to brands. And at first it was to smaller brands that we might previously have turned down or not worked with before and we offered it and we have everything from like a startup tier to like a so for example your friend who started like an almond milk company all the way to like like maybe a company the size of like all birds they might use this software just to scale the work they're already doing searching and finding creators or managing groups of creators they work with got it collaborating with them like tracking revision history shipping products that kind of stuff yeah and then the back end like tracking stats like actual impressions you know maybe if they boosted the content tracking its performance but the SaaS tier has been, it's been, there's been a lot of traction with that. And I think it's because people now are doing regular, like they're doing regular partnerships with people on Instagram, at least and YouTube, regular partnerships have driven a lot more success than like a one-off transactional one. Mm-hmm. And um, for the people like, you know, in all birds, they use that whole suite of tools, but we've been investing more in marketing now simply because almost any brand can use it, even at a smaller scale. So yeah. we've actually seen one or two brands from the way early days that we used to work with in the first like early product swap days where even a small coffee shop could, you know, pay for the, the low end tier that's a couple hundred bucks a month and just use it to search and find for influencers in their city and like offer them free products in exchange for a post. And so they're all in costs could be just, you know, a couple hundred bucks just to connect with the creators, get content and um, build like a brand ambassador like relationship. Right. And so 
we've done more marketing just to um, reach that broader like tier of of startups and growth brands recently. There's, I think everyone on the podcast <clears throat> that we've had on, or I guess the majority of them, they're either past the point or getting to the point of like, we need to start using influencer marketing shit that I did in Boston. They got on Katie Couric just from Instagram. Nice. Or they, they partnered with her, but that's their whole strategy. Their, heart, their whole strategy is influencer marketing. I'll give like, it, so my, my like, intro to influencer marketing content What's creation yeah. yeah so like no just like it, trying to be as helpful as i can so if you're i'll give i'll go through the stages um if you're just starting out like you i've just launched a almond milk product or you know you've just launched a new company making e- like apparel or whatever it is i'll talk about consumer companies first i would you know probably you're going to spend some of your budget on adwords because that's a really effective tool be your best bet after that is just reaching out to a creator and getting them to create pieces of content I think our average on the platform is like three or 400 bucks for like a photo and maybe like under a grant, like a grand for a video. And how many followers just to give that side of it to? Um, we have people ranging from, you know, 10,000 to a couple, you know, to multi millions. But I just say like your average Instagrammer, for example, might have like, you know, 25 or 50,000 followers, but you know, they'll charge less if you're just asking for content than mm-hmm. if you're asking for a post. And you could find people just, you know, you could reach, you could use tools like pop pays because at the startup tier, it's like, you know, it, it's just a couple hundred bucks a month, depending on what you're getting. But you could also just reach out on Instagram if you're just starting out and you have no budget. Right. Just find some people just from searching Instagram, message them, offer them free product. It's harder. Like you won't get the same quality of influencers when you're just offering free product. But if you're scrappy and you have no budget, you can find people that like, and you know, it's good. If, they, if they're if they doing it for product, they're, maybe they're an earnest fan of the product. But no, they're probably just going to post a photo. It's not going to be some... Oh, no. Super- and, and I would even just start off with this. Like if you're, if you're really budget constrained, I would just get a couple of pieces of content and boost it on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Influencers at the early stage are probably not the right vehicle for converting sales. Um, granted, you can have a TikTok video go viral and that does just drive like tremendous growth, but uh, that's a whole separate thing I'll get into. But at the early stages, I would advocate, you know, spending your money on Google AdWords, getting a piece of content um, in a cost efficient way. And then, you know, putting, if you, even if you have a grand or two, like experimenting with paid social and trying to get sales from paid social. Okay. Um, beyond that, you can start building brand ambassadors by shipping, you know, your product to people on YouTube, Instagram, they build, they get posts and awareness. And that does build an engine over time of driving word of mouth. But unlike the quick hit of advertising, where it's like you get immediate sales, you see the direct ROI, this is building an engine of like brand ambassadors, basically. Companies like Glossier, they've they've really built this over time. And you'll want to find those brand ambassadors because they'll be a steady sort of steady source of content and you know awareness and consideration. Like they will slowly convert people who follow them to consider your product. Beyond that, you should experiment with TikTok because it's such a fertile place to play. We had a friend of company, um, D Scout, they're not even like a consumer. Well, they basically have a marketplace where you can basically sign up to be like a user to test things. And their post went viral and they got like so many downloads that crashed their server wow. on TikTok. So it can work. But B2B, I would focus on making content and using Facebook's ad tools to target that post to the right audience. Right. It's interesting. Google, Facebook still one and two. They it still is. dominate. Yeah. Um, the power of creators for that is that they've got. Um, a lot like their content is very cost effective and then you can leverage facebook and instagram's um, amazing ad tools to target the right businesses so for example for pop pays you know we advertise to smbs and um we know we can hit the exact type of audience we need with our content so it makes it really easy for us to like right get in front of the right brands and for us let's just say so on the podcast right typically our clips are like uh, us just talking mm-hmm. nothing's really flashy nothing's disappearing yep. you're not getting afraid right in terms of content, do you have any advice for what type of content people should post? What's um, what does the data suggest in terms of uh, most impressions? Well, I mean, so like, what it's, I think I drilled down to like, what problem would you be trying to solve? Like, mm. focusing on that. Like, where where would you start with? Um, right, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So if it's like selling a product, probably highlight the product in a cool way, meaningful way. Yeah, and um, I'd always drill back down to like, what problem are you trying to solve? If you're trying to drive awareness and consideration, influencer posts can be a good tool. If you're trying to drive sales, um, you just using that content and ads with like tracking links to, to measure and, and refine right. that work over time can be important. Um, but what you're talking about like content for this podcast, like how do we advertise this? Yeah. Um, how would you I do mean, it? Well, you guys, so you naturally, curious. you naturally make a lot of good, um, content. So like with, with you, you're almost a influencer and a content creator in and of your, itself. And so you're making this content. Um, Thank you so I, much. I would just, um, <laughs> no, you, you are. So like you have an audience and you make content. So you're both. I usually say content creator as like 
they're known for their content, whereas an influencer is known for their audience. So like mm. kind of a Kim K versus like, you know, a, a really creative That's artist on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Great but for you guys, you could take clips of this video. Video works really well. Um, I'd always lean towards video, but you take clips of this and put it on Facebook and Instagram and boost it towards people that follow uh, similar uh, right. brand, like whether it's um, how I built this. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, let's say that you're, um, Gary you know, yeah, if, if you're launching a soap company, you probably boost your products to people that follow like Dove and right. like Axe or whatever. Right. So yeah, it's, it's basically taking clips of content. Like content is oxygen for brands. You need the content. Yeah. And then using smart targeting to reach the right audience. This is very much a Y Combinator conversation, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the startup comes in, they ask the question mm -hmm. and you get the answer so directly. Yeah, and um, another thing is like <laughs> measuring and refining, like being agile. Totally. Like the mistake of the past was people investing a lot in content and then just pushing it out and not changing things. The people that, who I see who are doing the best things with content now, they make the content and they see how it's received and immediately they're working with the creator on the next batch to refine it. So for example, if you guys took clips from the show and, or let's say, I'll just contrast two companies, like the sub company and like, let's take a B2B company, like I'm making internet conferencing software. You know, there's like very totally. different asks. Right. The sub company probably can use influencers on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera the b2b company cannot like they're not gonna it's gonna be hard to find a linkedin influencer or like a for someone to promote your b2b software That's but funny. um on the soap side for example i'm gonna you, start telling people i'm linkedin influencer yeah. <laughs> you, you can the one and only yeah no there are i mean i, I know some people like when gary v or justin khan post they totally. get like a ton of, ton yeah. of views and, and linkedin actually drives a significant amount of traffic you'd, you'd be surprised for example the soap company you might test out with tiktok we're talking about something right now around like people are surprised in this day and age that you should wash your hands for like 20 <laughs> seconds instead of five seconds. And so you might it's have the a happy birthday, right? You got to do the happy birthday. Yeah, exactly. There's so many yeah. songs coming out right now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you might, you might have a, like oh, people doing a TikTok just talking about like, um, what song did they use to like, um, like wash what funny hands. mnemonic do they use to like, and it might be something really silly. Hence got the, it. hence the views. But anyways, you might experiment with TikTok giving to people on, on YouTube who just talk about like eco-friendly products or whatever, Instagram influencers with lifestyle things. You're getting a bunch of content. Some of this might hit and go viral. Probably not. Most things don't. But you get this content and when you boost it, you'll see which ones you're converting. And so right. you kind of lean into that. Like you say, oh, Instagram stories are converting when we're using like outside photography or whatever. And then on the B2B side, you would just purely just be creating like maybe some lifestyle content. Like it's us chatting on the table and then it cuts to like a motion graphics video of like the software being used to make this stuff easier or whatever, some some text overlay. Oh, so cool. it's more a video editor. Yeah. And then you'd boost that and then refine like the targeting based on like, oh, when we boost this to people who um, are work from work from home companies, it works really well or whatever. I so like it. That makes Facebook's sense. targeting is so granular. It's amazing. You can target like, it's scary. Uh, you could target <laughs> people who work at Home Depot or women who are pregnant but only like six months pregnant. Like it's it's crazy targeted. Yeah, it's it's it is scary. That's why I, I always encourage people to think of content in the context of media. Don't just think about Instagrams in a vacuum because or, or like influencers in a vacuum because that by itself probably won't do the trick for you. You've got to think about media and content kind of holistically. Yeah. We we just hired a social media person and the her whole thing was data. I mean, yeah. she, she her whole thing is post the content she also creates content but then she posts it she sent us a google sheet very generic but obviously and she's tracking everything impressions views clicks mm. and we're just seeing you know we'll refine as we go you'll learn a lot of things if you if you take a, a peek at like if you just look at the data you need to run enough experiments but if you run right. like 50 experiments two of them are going to work and so um you'll see it and you'll see it hit and that's when you that's where you invest do you ever think about or worry about Instagram changing in any way or maybe even eating you up in some way or, um, or no. acquiring you? I mean, what's the what's the relationship? I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Smart answer. No, no. I, yeah, I mean, no. We view Pop Pays as a content operating system and we view it as way more than, than just Instagram. Although Instagram is an important, like we're a Facebook and an Instagram marketing partner. They're an important part of our ecosystem. And I have some friends at Facebook who are some of my best friends and some people there are earnestly so helpful, like our partnerships manager, Sim, uh, he's so helpful that he's just an extension of your team. Mm. And we we get so much from them because we are listening to like where, where their product roadmap is, they're listening to where ours is, and we collaborate really effectively. But at the end of the day, our job is to build something very durable. And we view Pop Pays as an engine for creating content for anything. We've had people like Macy's has used our content in billboards in Times Square. People have used it like Dunkin' Donuts or Jimmy John's in like in-store menus. 
but we specialize in social because of the, the speed, scale, and the data that you get. But we have been investing a lot in these other things like um, everything from uh, TikTok and other networks to um, content for ads on you know Facebook, Instagram, other, other ad networks, just so that it's broader than you know Instagram influencers, as an example. And so we are trying to build something that's very durable. And if we lost, you know, access to these networks, we could still be, we still have a community of creators that can make content and it's a viable asset, like broadly speaking. But we always are keeping an eye out for not being too dependent on one thing and keeping an eye on, on what we can do that's, that provides durable value. Because, you know, look, it matters about, the durability matters. Like Vine was a huge success, but it's not here. And same with many so true. great companies. And so we look at content as, there has always been a media channel, whether it's out of home, digital, TV, radio, Facebook, influencers, but the one constant has been content. Right. And so we want to we want to own that That's in the long term. Yeah, we want to we want to own that, and it's a long journey. It's going to take <clears> us a, you know a decade more to to really be where we want to be. But we're constantly thinking about like where is the market and where can we play in that. Tell everyone, brand, influencer, where they can find you, website, yeah. Instagram, give it all. Online. So it's popularpays.com. And then for all of our handles, you know, um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, TikTok, all the handles are just at popularpays. And if you're a creator, we have a, an iOS app for content creators and a web app. And so you can browse different gigs uh, across all the networks. And then as a brand, just reach out to us, um, check out our info online, and then reach out to us if you want to sign up. So we're happy to we're happy to talk you through all these strategies and um, there's stuff for everyone. Even if you're a small brand and you don't have much of a budget, we'll point you in the right direction or you can use our light tier. And then if you're an enterprise brand, we can lean in and help you with these strategies, uh, like with uh, service and support. And on one last note, what do, uh, what advice would you give for a budding entrepreneur? Someone like you who was in your position eight years ago. Uh, don't give up. Yeah. Keep it moving. Um, you probably, if, if you're just starting, you probably didn't know what you got yourself into. But <laughs> if you just stay alive, then you can be successful. It's, it, it's all about just persisting. Um, grit matters a lot more than anything else. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Thanks yeah. for coming Thanks on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, guys. It was great. The Startup Storefront team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capellini, Megan Conrad, Haley Nelson, Owen Capellini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is composed by Double Touch. We've got more great episodes coming out every week, so if you aren't already, consider subscribing. This is a very supportive and helpful community of entrepreneurs, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Startup Storefront. Because in case you didn't know, we film all of our episodes and release them a day early on YouTube. And you can always go back and listen to any of our other episodes, available wherever you get your podcasts, and on our website, startupstorefront.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.